Laura was there for my very first sermon. I was preaching from 1 Corinthians 13. I was 20 years old. We had just gotten married. And uh, this is June of, uh, I guess I was 21. It was like June of, of 1982. And I preached uh, from 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, and I was all out of love in eight minutes. <laughs> I was so nervous. It wasn't that I was a reluctant preacher. I just didn't have much experience. Contrast that with Jonah in chapter 3, who has another opportunity to do the right thing. And he will reluctantly because um, he did not want God to change the lives of those Ninevites. But God had another plan. Pastor Mark Hensley here tonight with my wife, Laura, in my office at uh, the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church. Hope that you're doing well. I'm glad you're watching. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, second chances and uh, initial opportunities and the service that we have in serving you is such an honor. Help us to never take for granted what it means to bear one another's burdens, to pray for each other, to pray for this country, to pray for the world, to pray for Israel, to pray for those in the Gaza Strip, families and children and babies and moms and grandparents and the aged. And we pray, Father, that the peace-loving people in the Gaza Strip will get to safety and that Israel will be strong to do what they have to do. We do pray for an end of the Hamas, Hamas terrorists. And I think the most wonderful thing that could happen for them is if they could come to know you. And there will never be peace in any heart, in any city, in any state, in any nation without you uh, changing the populace. Thank you for our life's change. Help us to reflect it in day-to-day -day decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so remember the story of Jonah. We're in chapter 3 tonight. It's a very short, tight chapter, but it's, as you can imagine, chock full of intrigue and um, insight. Jonah has been uh, vomited out on dry land, and he is making his way to Nineveh. Uh, his um, attitude has been adjusted. <laughs> Do you remember when you'd have to adjust your kids' attitudes? I do. Don't you remember that? And uh, and by the way, our sons will probably say, if you ask them, that dad was the more fun, playing, easygoing person in the house. Laura was more uh, demanding and had higher expectations. It's not that I didn't have high expectations, but, but um, you knew how to take care of business. In fact, one time Tyler made something for her and colored it. Remember that? And he, on that piece of paper, spelled mean MoMA, right? That's what he thought of you. Well, she wasn't mean. She just wouldn't let them get away with stuff. And for any child, that makes you pretty a mean MoMA. But tonight, um, Jonah is going to get a second chance. Let's read about it. Jonah chapter 3, beginning of verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Aren't you grateful for second opportunities, second chances? God is the God of second chances. He forgives us and cleanses us and releases us to opportunities to serve him. And inevitably, because we carry within us a sin nature, we, we need to have uh, an attitude readjustment and we need to come back to him. And, uh, you know, the Bible teaches that when we're saved, the Holy Spirit comes within us. But there are many subsequent fillings of the Holy Spirit in your lifetime. Um, we are encouraged, actually really commanded, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Christ in the Christian. It is, it's God's Spirit, fully God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a compass. He directs us to God's will for our lives. <clears throat> he's a teacher. He's a comforter. He's a friend. He can be grieved. He can be hurt. He aids us in praying. When we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit makes those prayers clear to God, Romans chapter 8. But tonight, um, the message of the gospel placed in this prophet, and by then, back then, by the way, how you say pay. Pastor, how are people saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the coming of the Messiah? In fact, it's interesting. The Lord Jesus um, 
recognizes the importance of Jonah. In fact, it says in, um, you remember a, a generation of people came to the Lord and uh, his generation and said, we want a sign. And he knew them to be a, uh, a, a people who were really just after uh, kind of the shock and awe experiences of being around Jesus. But in Matthew's gospel, we learn that the unbelieving scribes and Pharisees were demanding a sign from Jesus. He told them that they would be given the sign of the prophet Jonah. This is in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 and 39. For as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man indeed will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. I liked what Tony Evans said about this. He said, when Jonah came out of the fish, carrying a message of repentance to Nineveh, God would show compassion to Nineveh through the symbolic death and resurrection of this prophet Jonah. Some scholars believe Jonah died and God brought him back to, uh, to physical life when he uh, had the, the great fish uh, basically blast him out on the shore. Uh, because uh, he had him, well, in fact, the best way to describe it is what it says in the scripture. Uh, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights. And he basically, I hate to be so graphic, but he upchucked Jonah out on, out on the uh, dry land. And so, Jonah has, is a type of Christ in the sense that the Lord has showed us mercy by his actual death and resurrection. The Son of God, indeed, Billy, uh, our study Bible reminds us, reminds us that something greater than Jonah is here. And Jesus is much greater, of course. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah, get up a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh. And when it says great, it's not that it had any laudable qualities. Uh, if anything, they were great sinners. Uh, this is the ancient um, Assyrians. The Ninevites were wicked people. They were like Hamas today or Hezbollah or, if you will, ISIS. These are wicked people. They would, they would kill uh, their enemies and then parade them fillet them, and make them the object of ridicule and scorn. You see that even with Hamas. There's a reason why Israel is going to take them all out. They're vicious people. But in this context, Jonah has been given a second chance to do the right thing. And the Bible says, I, I like the response in verse 3, Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's commands. Who knows what he looked like? what he smelled like, and how far it was to Nineveh. But one thing we know about Nineveh, it was a big city. Verse, um, still in verse 3, Now Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three-day walk. Now understand, people then would walk, it wouldn't be uncommon, they'd walk 15, 20 miles a day. So if you think of a city, an ancient city, 60 miles uh, around, that is a big city. I think of Colorado Springs, it's a lot bigger than Green River, Wyoming, isn't it? I don't remember it being in a, Laura, do you remember being in a traffic jam in Green River? Unless it was bad snow, bad weather. Bad snow, was it. Maybe uh, there might be some antelope on the road, but yeah. you, not traffic for the most part. Nope. So it says in verse 4, Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and he proclaimed, here's the message God gave to Jonah that he did not want to um, share with the Ninevites for the express purpose. Uh, his, his concern was they will get right with God. Israel then, Jonah then, could not stand the Assyrians then. And there was such animosity and tension between those two people groups that Jonah did not want anything positive to happen for them. It's really important that we feel and understand that everyone needs to be saved. 
I love something that President Lincoln said once. It was after the Civil War, and they were doing the uh, trying to heal the country, and they were rebuilding cities, and and there were not a few. There were a lot of people, I should say, that um, were really angry at President uh, Lincoln because they thought he was being too kind and too gracious to his enemies, meaning the Confederacy. I loved what he said, as only he could say it, that six foot four um, lawyer, trained lawyer, said this. Do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? That's what needs to happen in Israel, in the <laughs> Gaza Strip, with Iran, with North Korea, with our relations with these nations that hate us. But we all know the reality of that is quite dismal apart from Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus can make us brothers and sisters in him. We've had that experience um, meeting people, different background, different ethnicity, but a passionate love for Jesus. And we are often closer to them than our own family because we are connected in the most wonderful way. Christ in them resonates with the Christ in us. And it's a beautiful thing. But Jonah's got a mission. He's got to deliver a message. He's reluctant to do it because here's the message. Listen to this. And I think he probably enjoyed saying this part of the message. Can I just tell you? In 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. Wow. Can you imagine? When I was called to my first church, Rocky Ford, if that was my opening line, you know, <laughs> call me to this city and in 40 days it will be demolished. <laughs> I think the public committee would be like, what are we doing? His message was very stark, very succinct, very troubling. <clears throat> and it's not, it didn't say it in the text, but he had to finish the rest of the, the message because of the response of the people. So I'm kind of reading into the text, but I really believe he also let them know, but if you repent, if you commit your lives to God, he will stay his hand and offer you forgiveness. That had to be the message because of the response. Here is the response that you would think would thrill any proclaimer of God's nearness and forgiveness. In 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. Here's the people's response. Then the people of Nineveh believed God. Remember, belief in God is not something we arbitrarily can muster up. The Bible's very clear. We love him because he first loved us. Jesus reminds us in John 6, that no man comes to the Father unless the Holy Spirit uh, or lest God woos them or draws them. When you got saved, I promise you, it, initially it wasn't your idea. You may say, but pastor, I felt that I needed to come. I know you did. I felt that I needed to confess. I know you did. But the need part, God planted in your heart. Now, I believe when it comes to receiving God, there's these two wonderful truths, God's sovereignty, God determines who will be saved. Uh, we can't arbitrarily be saved. He has to initiate the love relationship. But there is the responsibility of man and women to respond to the gospel. My own beautiful wife pretty much ran from God for three, was it three weeks, three Sundays? Is that a fair statement? God was speaking into her heart. She's 17 years old. She felt the wooing, the convicting of the Holy Spirit, but she waited and she waited. And then on a Sunday night, her waiting was over. I feel like I was there that night. I would have been 16. You're 17. But the invitation, was that the night that was so stormy? Do you remember? She knew, she had made up her mind to give her life to Christ. And when Lewis Atkinson extended the invitation, no one beat her to the front row. 
I mean, she was on her way. She was committed. She was determined. She was going to know the Lord. And But back up. It was God who drew her with tender hands. He drew you. Ere I ever knew him. That's what with loving hands, loving cords of love, the old hymn says. And so we, we love him because he first loved us. Jonah has shared the message that uh, your city's going down. It's going to be destroyed in 40 days. But there is this other part of the message that God will forgive you if you will turn to him. They do. That's what repentance is. It's a 180. It's turning from sin, turning to Christ. And then the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. There was this outward expression of brokenness and repentance. They were contrite. And the Bible teaches that a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. We come to him in our spiritual weakness and our depravity. And remember, grace is the gravity that lifts us from our depravity. We love him because he initiates the love relationship. He invites us into um, a family that never ends. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right or the privilege to be the children of God, those who believe in his name. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you want to know God and God draws you to himself, you can be changed, your whole destiny altered. You become a part of a never-ending family. You're adopted. You belong. You have a place. You are no longer on the outside looking in. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home. That's why we write about it. We sing about it. We preach about it. The change that God in his wonderful son can bring to a human heart is absolutely epic. And I know you've experienced that if you're a believer and you know it's true. He is so amazing. No wonder. We still sing amazing grace. And so they, um, they, they put on sackcloth. It was an outward sign of mourning, of brokenness. They're contrite. God, in a sweeping movement of his spirit, is touching one of the wickedest cities in history and transforming a whole people group. And, and I want to tell you this before I forget. The alteration, the change in those people was so dramatic. Laura, you'll find it interesting. It lasted for over 100 years. Ultimately, the Assyrians would turn back to their wicked ways and their idolatry and their pagan worship and all their venomous uh, acts against humanity. But there was this 100-year window where these people had their whole lives changed and their descendants' lives changed. And we're going to see them in heaven. We're going to be able to sit down, Laura, with some of those Ninevite warriors who came to Christ back here. I can't wait to ask them, what was Jonah like? Did he stink? Did he smell like fish? Did he, what was his sermon like? Did he, was he animated? Was, was, because I think he was subdued. I think it was more like, in 40 days, this city is going to be destroyed. Unless you give your life to God. Unless you get saved by looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Unless you identify with God's forgiveness through repentance. Well, good news travels fast. Verse 6. When word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, and put on sackcloth. That's pretty amazing. Can you imagine if that would happen in, in the halls of Congress and the Senate and in the White House and, and, and that uh, the leaders that are in place now in the United States would be humbled by the power of Almighty God and seek his face? the reason why the Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That would be awesome. And then he issued a decree in Nineveh. It had so moved him that he wants to make a political statement. Here it is. By order of the king and his nobles, no person or animal, herd or flock is to taste anything at all. 
They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both people and animals must be covered with sackcloth and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from his wrongdoing. And here's this caveat. This is the hopeful concluding thinking about this announcement. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. Wow. We need leaders like that today who will not only be open to hearing from God, but when they hear from God, will do something about it. Uh, we have this new um, Speaker of the House um, who's a Christian, who loves the Lord. And I don't know that you've read this, Laura, but um, he uh, is very outspoken in his faith and his love for the Lord. And he made a, a statement recently that he and his 17-year-old son are accountability pro uh, partners with their cell phones, and they've, they've downloaded an app that helps them to be accountable for purity on their phones so that they, they don't look at pornography. And now, here's the world we live in. We know what he meant by that. That doesn't mean he's looking at pornography. He's saying, I'm going to help my son be accountable. He's going to help me be accountable so that neither of it, neither one of us do because we're, we're helping each other because we live in a world that's washed in sewage and temptation with a click of a, of, of a button. And it's a laudable thing. And these writers, these secular writers in America spin that story, folks, and here's what they say. He is, he is sharing with his 17-year-old son um, their, uh, their uh, take on pornography or, or if they look at pornography. It's like, no, he's not. They put something on their phones that inhibits them from looking at pornography. It, it's just the world we live in is so messed up that if a person tries to do the right thing, they're not only mocked for it, they are then uh, they're left to scorn. Uh, just like um, there's um, a prolific writer and a Christian uh, minister that um, made a statement about how important it is to support Israel and and deal with Hamas and certainly have protection for the innocent in the Gaza Strip. <clears throat> and they they totally twist the title of their article to suggest that he's a hate monger and he's not. He just wants people to know the Lord. Well, it's going to get worse before we're out of here. But don't forget, we have a message to tell. Some will respond here. The response is amazing. Contrast that with the modern day Israel. I shared with the congregation Sunday, 74% or so of Israel, uh, the people of Israel are Jewish. 1.9% are Christians in the Holy Land. So most Jewish people are, a whole lot of Jewish people are not only secularized, but some, a vast majority, are, would be agnostics or atheists. <clears throat> the challenge is to keep sharing the good news. Sow the seed, and remember, you reap later than you sow. So the king of Nineveh, it's also broken. He issues a decree that affects not only the people, but even the animals. I bet the animals are like, man, this is the Mediterranean. Why are you putting this cloth on me? Why can't I drink something? Well, they couldn't not drink for long because, again, that scorching heat in the Mediterranean would necessitate drinking and eating. But they're definitely taking some time out to consider their spiritual state. We need to do the same. And the question I'd ask for you, based on... Jonah chapter 3 is, what are you doing about that part of you that will live forever? Verse 10, here's the response. Verse 10 could be the response for Israel and Hamas and the Palestinians and Americans and Iranians and the North Koreans and the people in Turkey and Russia. Listen to the response. God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways. So God 
relented from the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. Isn't that something? God had decided, because of their brokenness, to not destroy Nineveh. Next week, we're going to get into exactly how Jonah felt about these turn of events. And remember this, Jonah's message was well received and he was not happy about it. Um, remember this, folks, if we're still alive, there's still time for us to repent. Jonah almost missed the privilege of participating in this great evangelistic event because he didn't like what God wanted him to do. So remember, if you run from God's will, you might miss out on one of the most significant moves of God in your life. Here's a Tony Evans commentary on the final verse about God's response. God never changes, but he can adjust to the changes in humans while he doesn't change his holy standards. In this case, repentance produced something for his grace and mercy to respond to. God has enough grace and mercy for everyone, including people that you've given up on and I've given up on. So remember, he can get through when you can't. Father, thank you for your word to us tonight. We do pray for the salvation of people worldwide, that in these tumultuous times, they would turn their eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We pray for the salvation of Israel and the Palestinians and Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran, North Korea, South Korea, China, Russia, Turkey, every nation in the world that you in a movement of your Holy Spirit would draw people to your Son before it's too late. Guide and bless each one watching tonight. Thank you for the privilege to be with them and bless them richly is my prayer. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Pastor Mark Hensley with my wife, Laura, on the other side of the camera saying, have a good rest of your evening. Look forward to hopefully seeing you Sunday. I continue a series through the Ten Commandments. And so would love to have you be a part of that this Sunday. Good night, folks.